if a man is found slain, lying in a field in the land Yahuwah, your God, is giving to you to, to possess, and if it is not known who killed him, your elders and judges shall go out and measure the distance from the body to the neighboring towns. Then the elders of the town nearest to the body shall take a heifer that has never been worked and has never worn a yoke and lead her down to a valley that has not been plowed or planted and where there is a flowing stream. There in the valley, they are to break the heifer's neck. The priests, the sons of Levi, shall step forward for Yahuwah your God has chosen them to minister and to, and to pronounce blessings in the name of Yahuwah and to decide all cases of dispute and assault. Then all the elders of the town nearest the body shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. And they shall declare, our hands did not see this blood, nor did our eyes see it done. Accept this atonement for your people Israel whom you have redeemed, O Yahuwah, and do not hold your people guilty of the blood of an innocent man, and the blood shed will be atoned for. So you sh will purge from yourselves the guilt of shedding innocent blood, since you have done what is right in the eyes of Yahuwah. This is a very important passage and utterly ignored. It is not just for the Jews living in Israel, although it was part of the law given, and it specifically says things that happen in the land that God will give you, but it gives the picture of justice and how justice should be handled in a particularly difficult case. That is the case of the insoluble murder. There are murders which are insoluble. We just don't know who did it. Unfortunately, the concept arises that there needs to be retribution. It's what they used to talk about. Now they talk about closure. We need to have closure. And so somebody must be penalized. Someone must be put to death or someone must spend the rest of their life in jail so that the family of the victims will have closure that someone is paying for the death of their relative. Even it has gotten to the point where in some appeals cases, where it has been clear that evidence shows that the man behind bars is innocent, judges have said, no, there is no grounds for appeal because then the closure which this conviction has given to the family would be taken away from the innocent family of the victim of the murder. This is a horrible injustice. And in America today, very frequently, the injustice is also tainted with racism. And there are many men who have been put to death and many, many more who are behind bars, though innocent, in order to gain closure. And here, Yahweh teaches us how we should approach this issue of closure in the case of the unsolvable murder. It would be good if we applied these principles in our laws and in our courts today. What's that? Oh, yeah, there, the word marriage in the title of this lesson yeah, yes, it's, it is titled Marriage and the Heifer in the Valley. But there is nothing in this passage that is relevant to marriage. Yeah, that's why it's titled Marriage and the Heifer in the Valley, because nothing in this passage, relevant as it is to justice and our situation today, and valid as it still is, there is nothing about marriage in it. So, okay, am I talking in circles? Yes, I am talking in circles. Am I being absurd? Yes, I am being absurd. Why? Because there is an ongoing discussion about marriage and the authority over marriage that the government, 
Caesar claims, and that some people want the government to have so that their particular whims regarding marriage can be satisfied by having the government agree with them. This is an ongoing debate in the what in the world. It is an ongoing debate in this country, and in many individuals' lives, it is an ongoing debate because of their personal situation. What does that have to do with the heifer in the valley? The heifer in the valley has nothing whatsoever to do with marriage, even though it is a rock solid scripture that we should heed. There will be in the Christian debate on where is the authority over what is valid marriage, when is, if ever, divorce acceptable and recognized by God, and is there such a thing as godly remarriage? In that debate, which honest people can disagree on, but there will be a illegitimate attempt to bring in scriptures which are utterly irrelevant, such as the heifer in the valley. Not that I think anyone will actually bring the heifer in the valley into that debate, but they will bring in Romans chapter 13. They will bring in Titus, uh, is it 3 1? They will bring in uh, 1 Peter. I had the number memorized a minute ago. Submission to rulers. And they will bring in Luke chapter 20, verse 25. And when they bring in Luke chapter 20, verse 25, they will apply it exactly the opposite of what it says. Because what it says, when it says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, having established that this can be determined by the image. And as we have seen in other lessons, marriage is absolutely, totally, and completely in the image of God, and therefore in the God-only realm that has never been handed over to the secular government authority, to Caesar. The only point that Luke 20, verse 25 makes is that those other passages about the authority given to secular government are irrelevant in this discussion on what is and what is not legitimate Christian marriage. And that is why I titled this Marriage and the Heifer in the Valley to illustrate how there are scriptures that valid as they are to other situations of justice and authority nothing to say on questions of marriage.